Whoops. Okay. We're back, Saints. We're back. We're here. We were just muted, but I was just saying how thankful I am to be here. Good evening and happy blessed Sabbath to you all. I pray that God has been richly blessing you throughout this week. I wanted to share with you all something so beautiful that my best friend shared with me from the book, The Desire of Ages. It was such a great blessing to my soul. And I know that it will be a great blessing to your soul as well. You've gone through a maybe a difficult and a challenging week, or you may have had a series of uninterrupted victories this week, but whichever one it was, God has been with you all along the way. And there's something so beautiful that I read that I said, I have to share this with my friends tonight, right when we start. And it's a beautiful thought taken from the book, The Desire of Ages, where it says that through every age, even through every generation, even in your life, through every hour, the love of God had been exercised toward the fallen race. God's love through every moment has been exercised towards you throughout this week. Notwithstanding the perversity of men, the signals of mercy had been continually exhibited. Notwithstanding your perversity, your sinfulness, where you've been less than the best, notwithstanding when you haven't said the right thing, haven't done the right thing, notwithstanding any of those things, the signals of God's mercy has been in your life. And when the fullness of time had come, the deity was glorified by pouring upon the world a flood of healing grace, a flood <laughs> of healing grace. Tonight, God has for us a flood of healing grace, a flood that streams from the threshold of glory, a flood that streams from Calvary's cross. God has a flood of healing love, of healing grace that is never to be obstructed or withdrawn till the plan of salvation should be fulfilled. Over your life, God has a flood of healing grace that he will not stop pouring out upon you until you are saved. I don't know what's going on in your life, but what I do know is that you got to get to Jesus. He's the only one that could answer all of your needs. He could solve every single one of your problems. You just need to get to Jesus and experience the flood of his healing grace. You just have to experience it to know what I'm talking about. You have to feel it for yourself, changing and transforming your heart. And this is what God in Christ has for you and for me. If you didn't experience the fullness this week, I pray that from right now, tonight, from what we're going to be considering and studying, that you will sense God's healing grace in your heart, but not just for you, also for your family, 
your friends, your brothers and sisters. So I hope that you have taken a moment to share this video with them because what we're going to be studying, the parable of the 10 virgins and the procession. This will be a view of, of the parable of the 10 virgins that you may not have ever seen before. And if you have seen and studied this with us before, we have even more by the grace of God that we would show to you as God has revealed even more, continues to reveal even more to us. And I believe that he would continue to reveal more to you. So we're looking forward to reading the thoughts that you would share with us in the chat as we're studying God's word together. God has special things for us. So without any further ado, saints, let us get into the word of God and receive the great blessings that he has for us. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love, for your grace, for your mercy, for your light, for your healing grace. Lord, many of us have different things going on in our life that is hard to explain. But nevertheless, life continues to go on. Sometimes we may feel a bit stuck. But you know. You know our hearts. You know our circumstance. You know our minds. You know where we are. And from wherever it is that we are, you have assured us that you would flood your healing grace upon us. Flood your healing grace. That 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 your former and, and latter rain may flood down upon us and bring healing to our souls. Forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. We pray that this blessed study and message may go near, far, and wide, and that your people may be enriched with the truth as it is in Jesus for this time that we'll be considering. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Yeah, this was such a very special, special quote. The, the fact that, that upon this world, Christ wants to pour out, he wants, he, he would pour out a flood of healing grace, a, pl a flood of healing grace. And I like the next, the next paragraph. I'm just going to read that, that one underlying statement there where it says that Jesus came to restore in man the image of his maker. You see, we are right now living in the generation of restoration, the generation of restoration, the generation in which God will restore his image to show before the whole entire world. God wants to restore his image in your heart, in your home, in your church, in your community. God determines to get it done, but it has to begin with you. It has to begin with you. Now, if one of you viewers are not familiar with the Bible and maybe you're familiar with, song, uh, with so, the songwriters of the world, you may be familiar with the song that says um, it, it, that it begins with the man in the mirror. It begins with you. God wants to bring a change in your life today. When you look at what's going on in the world right now, it is absolutely terrible. And God wants us, as we have been studying the time and continue to study the time, God wants to give us a sense of holy urgency. That's one of the reasons as to why we study the time. To have a sense of holy urgency, not just urgency, because the devils are pretty urgent considering the time. They know that their time is short, so they're looking to do their work. Are not Adventists familiar with the fact that time is short? And are not Adventists trying to uh, fulfill the, the work? We could just be devils. What's the difference? What exactly is the difference? It's understanding what exactly is the work that God has for us. What exactly is the work that God is trying to accomplish in us as well? Considering everything that's going on in the world today, God wants us to have a sense of holy urgency, an urgency that actually transforms our hearts, an urgency that actually makes us and, 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 and drives us into the direction of becoming just like God. Jesus. That's what God wants for you. And that's what God wants for me. He doesn't want for us to take up religion in a time of crisis because the man that takes up religion in the time of crisis will let go of that religion at the height of the crisis. God wants us to take the religion of Christ, the truth of Christ, true Christianity, because of what it is, the most beautiful thing in the world love. 
love. And that's what's lacking in the world right now. That is what is lacking in the world right now. And God wants you and I to seek him while he can be found because there is a point in time where he will no longer be able to be found. Let me read to you a couple of statements as we as 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 we're setting this as we're setting these thoughts up here. Whoops. Let's see here. Here we go. All right. There we go. Okay. These last day conditions press us to prepare. We are living in the time of the end. The fast fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is near at hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgments are already falling upon the despisers of the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war are portentous. They forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. We're living in the time of the end. Jesus is coming soon. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place on our world. And the final movements will be rapid ones. The present is a time of overwhelming interest in all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us? Have we considered what the thinking men and women of the world have been saying concerning the times that we're living in, the times that we have lived through, and the times that may be ahead? Have we read what they had to say? We have read. We have studied the things that the thinking men and women of the world are saying concerning the times that we've lived and the time that we're living in right now and the time that seem to be coming upon this world. They are watching. They're doing what? They're watching. Are you watching? This seems to be saying that they are watchmen but they don't know what they're looking for. They don't know what they're looking at. Are they more watchmen than we are? Do they know the watches of night better than we do? In our next study, we're going to be considering the watches of the night as we're considering the time of our visitation as a generation of restoration. That's our next study. They're watching the strained, restless relations that exist among the nations, such as the Ukraine, Russia, America, China, they observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element and are wreck and they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place. Something is going to happen, they recognize it. That the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. They recognize that. Do you? Some people say, uh, some of y'all Adventist preachers, you, you you guys talk too much about the crisis. You talk too much we talk too much about the crisis. Have you seen what the men of the world are saying concerning the crisis? Have you seen how, how dedicated they are? They're saying in 12 years, the world is going gonna, is gonna to collapse because of climate change. Do you see how they are so dedicated that they commit their life? They go to school for this, to become politicians, to do a change. And many of us, we watch Fox News, CNN, and we talk about them, all these silly politicians doing this. Yeah, they're committed to something. What are you committed to? They're committed to what they believe. Wrong or right, they're committed to it. They went to school for this. They, they, they studied for this. They, they graduated for this. They graduated studying what they believe so that they can make a change. Whether they know that it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. They, they have dedicated their life to this. Have you dedicated your life to the truth as it is in Jesus, as he's revealed it to us in his word? We talk, we talk too much about the crisis. The world talks every single day about the crisis. At least we talk about it, and God has given to us a message that can help us prepare. They talk about it with no preparation. We talk about it for the purpose of us making preparation. Remember what they said? They said around the year 2005, and this book was written in 1990, was published in 1997, and it took you know time to write the book. So before 1997, it, these things were already being written and published in 1997. Around the year 2005, a sudden spark will catalyze a crisis mood. This is what they say. Thinking men of this world in the book, The Fourth Turning. 
Remnants of the old social order will disintegrate. Political and economic trust will implode. Real hardship will beset the land with severe distress that could involve questions of class, race, nation, and empire. Yet this time of trouble, thinking men of the world, this is the, these are the terms that they use. You just can't avoid it. You just can't avoid it. What are they saying? Yet this time of trouble will bring seeds of social rebirth. Americans will have will share a regret about recent mistakes and a resolute new consensus about what to do. We know what this is. They're going to look at all the mistakes that we've done in the past. They're going to say that God is mad at us. We agree that something needs to be done. We need to enforce a national Sunday law. And anyone who goes against this as we're trying to solve this crisis, we must end them. Let me keep on reading. The very survival of the nation, the very survival of the nation will feel at stake sometime before the year 2025. America will pass through a great gate and history comment and history commensurate with the American Revolution, the Civil War, and twin emergencies of the Great Depression and World War II. That's, that's what they see around a little bit before 2005. When we study the watches, we're gonna we're gonna see we're gonna see in our next study. The risk of catastrophe will be very high. The nation could erupt into insurrection or civil violence. We, we've already seen um, a preview of that already. Civil violence crack up geographically or succumb to authoritarian rule. If there is a war, it is likely to be one of maximum risk and effort. In other words, a total war. So when the spirit of prophecy inspiration is letting us know that they recognize that something great and decisive of, is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis, the world recognizes that as well. The conditions of things in the world shows that troublous times are right upon us. The daily papers are full of indications of a terrible conflict in the near future. You can continue reading the rest. You know what it says. This is also found in Testimony to the Church, Volume 9 on page 11 and right around page 12 and 13 as well. The point is that we're living in a time of crisis, a time where Christ is needed. But what exactly is going on in the church? What exactly is going on with God's people during this time? Inspiration lets us know. There in the book of Evangelism, page 32 in paragraph four, there we're told, often we have been told that our cities are to hear the message, but how slow are we to heed the instruction? I saw one standing on a high platform with arms extended, extended. He turned and pointed in every direction saying, a world perishing in ignorance of God's holy law and seventh day Adventists are asleep. The Lord is pleading for laborers for there is a great work to be done. God has a great work for you and for me to get done. And in order for this work to get done, God is going to empower us. God is going to empower you and me. He's going to empower this generation of restoration to get this work done. Is the church asleep? Yes, fine. But is God going to get the work done of, war of waking up the church and warning those in the world, the sheep that are not yet of this fold, so that they can be prepared for the crisis and so that they could stand and at the very least be saved, make their choice for Christ? Yes, he will. And God is counting on you. He's counting on me to experience his love, to transform us and to do that work of enlightening the earth with his glory. God has special truths for the conditions of the generation. Special truths have been adapted to the conditions of the generations as they have existed. The present truth, which is a test to the people of this generation was not a test to the people of the generations far back. God has special truths for this, our generation. Special truths for our generation so that we can fulfill our divine position. God has special truths for us to fulfill our divine position and to experience that flood of healing grace. That flood of healing grace is the latter rain. We're going to talk about that a little bit more today. We're going to, matter of fact, we're, we're going to get right on into it. We're going to get right on into it because we have been considering, we're considering, and we're going to, we're going to get to the parable of the 10 virgins. Just follow me very, very carefully. Time of crisis we're living in. We've established that. 
Sadly, the church is asleep. We have established that. God is going to awaken and empower his church to finish the work. That's you and that's me. We saw this already in the prophet Joel's prophetic guide. In the prophet Joel's prophetic guide, we saw that God is going to empower us. We saw that God is going to empower us. We saw that God has special truths for all the generations. He had special truths for the first generation of Adventism, for the second generation, for the third, and for the fourth. He had special truths for all of those generations. We're going to be considering that and the latter parts in the later, you know, in later studies of this series, numbering our days. But God has a special truth for our generation, the generation of restoration. We were reading it in the book of Joel. So we're going to go to Joel chapter two. We want to read what exactly is the special truth. What is the special truth? What is the special thing that God has for this, our generation? So I'm going to go to Joel chapter 2. I'm going to go to Joel chapter 2. I'll read verse 23, verse 25, and verse 32 as well. Joel chapter 2. There we saw the prophetic guide, Joel's prophetic guide for this last generation. This was the prophet Joel's prophetic guide for this last generation. Okay? Now, Again, special truths for each generation. Let's see what God has for the generation, this generation. I want you to see that God is going to empower us. I need to make this point. Verse 23, the Bible says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord, for your in the, in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. In the first month, and the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall be shall be full shall overflow with wine and oil. Now watch this, and I will restore to you. That's why this generation is called the generation of restoration. We've already established that I, because he's going to restore us and restore things to us. I will restore to you the years of the locust that the locust had eaten, the cankerworm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. And you shall eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. So God has let us know in verse 25, that is how we have established that this generation is the generation of restoration because the locust, the palmer worm, the canker worm, and etc. cetera, right? And, 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 and the caterpillar, those were each generations that we read about already in Joel chapter one. Each of them represented a generation. Each of them represented a generation. And now God is saying, I will restore to you what those four pests, those previous generations, have eaten up. They, they caused a famine in the land. They destroyed the land. And God is telling the people that he would restore to them what was destroyed by those pests, which were a symbol of the generations. So God is now speaking to a new generation and is letting them know that they will be restored. That is why they're called the generation of restoration. Now, there is another name for this generation. Names are very significant. Names are very significant. There is another name for the generation of restoration, and it's found there in verse 23. In verse 23 there of the book of Joel and chapter 2, it says, be glad then, ye children of Zion. Ye children of Zion. When we read verse 23 to verse 25, he's speaking to the children of Zion, whom we are calling the generation of restoration. The children of Zion are the generation of restoration because he's saying, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down upon you the, the rain, the former rain, as well as the latter rain. And then in verse 25, he says to the children of Zion, I will restore to you that which was lost from the previous generations. So the generation of restoration, the other name for the generation of restoration is the children of Zion. The children of Zion, that is indeed a generation. Going back to Joel chapter one, it says, ye children, ye children, highlight that, ye children, ye children of Zion, ye children is a generation. I will prove it right now. The children represent a generation. The children represent a generation because in Joel chapter one, remember how we read there in verse three? We read in verse three, it says, tell ye your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. There you got it. 
another generation. So ye, your children, their children, and their children's children. So that's four generations, another generation. That's what that says there in verse three of Joel chapter one. So the children represent a generation. So when going back to Joel chapter two and verse 23, when reading about the children of Zion, that is speaking about the generation, that's speaking about the uh, particular generation that is the generation of restoration. That is the generation of restoration. Now, these are the children of Zion. The children of who? The children of Zion. Who's Zion? Who is Zion? Well, Zion is the people of God. Zion is the people of God. Isaiah chapter, what is it? Isaiah 51 and verse 16, right? Isaiah 51 and verse 16. There the Bible says, and I have put my words in thy mouth and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth. Say unto Zion, thou art my people. Say unto Zion, thou art my people. So Zion are the people of God. Do we get that? Zion, according to Isaiah 51 and verse 16, are the people of God. Zion are the people of God. So when we go back to the book of Joel, when we go back to the book of Joel and chapter 2, where we read the children of Zion, we know that the children represent a generation and that Zion represents the people of God. This is the final generation of the people of God. This is the generation of restoration, according to verse 25. And they receive the power of God. They receive the power of God because they're in verse 23, the children of God, the children of Zion, the generation of restoration. What does verse 25 say that they receive? They receive the former rain and they receive the latter rain. They receive the former rain and the latter rain. So the generation of restoration, which are the children of God, they receive the former and latter rain. They receive the former and latter rain. This generation is going to experience the latter rain, which is going to come in 10 times the power of the former rain. You know, early on in these studies, I was saying that those who will compose of the 144,000, they will know by experience these messages that we're sharing even now. They're going to know it by experience. They're going to know it intellectually and spiritually experientially. They're going to know this thing because they are the ones who are going to have this experience. They're in the generation of restoration. They're the children of God. They're the generation of God that are going to experience the latter rain. You know why? Um, because when, so, so the children of Zion, the children of Zion, let's go to Revelation chapter 14. Children of Zion, Revelation chapter 14. Children of Zion, Revelation chapter 14, what does it say in verse 1? And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 144,000. We're preparing to be in that number. Having the father's name written in their foreheads. So there they are, the children of Zion. They are on Mount Zion with the lamb, the 144,000. The those in the generation of, of restoration are making preparation to become the 144,000. They're making preparation to become the 140 and 4,000. These studies that we're doing, it's not just this is a good time. There's good stuff that we're, it, it, this is a good time. This is good stuff that we're going through, but this is preparation for the end. This is preparation for the end. I must continue and move along. But there is another name. There is another special name. There is another special name for particular individuals that are in the generation of restoration. Because even though you're part of the generation of restoration, that does not mean that you are going to be restored. Let that be key. Just because you go to church, that doesn't mean you're going to be saved. Just because you go to a camp meeting, that doesn't mean you're going to experience the latter rain. Just because you are a part of the generation of restoration, that does not mean that you are going to be restored. You must make a personal decision to experience restoration through cooperation, as God floods his divine grace, his healing grace over your life, you have to make a personal decision to have Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your savior, as the restorer of your soul. You have to make that personal decision. So now there are particular individuals, we're coming to the parable right now, there are particular individuals in the generation of restoration who will do a special work to continue to grow 
those who compose, those who are restored within this generation. There's a name for them. It's in, it's, it's, it's still in the book of Joel in chapter two. It's still in Joel chapter two. I'll, I'll pull it up because I, I need us to have a holistic view. We know that according to Joel chapter two, Joel chapter two, this is the uh, generation of restoration according to verse 25. This is the generation of the, of the children of God the children of Zion, generation of Zion, the people of God, they are going to experience the latter rain. What's another name for the generation of restoration? The, the children of God, the 140 and 4,000, the specific individuals in the generation of restoration that God is going to use to do a special work to, 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 how can I say this? To recruit more people to actually be restored in this generation. Let's go to verse 32. You already know the name. I'm not sharing with you anything that is new. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be delivered. As the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. The other name for those specific individuals. I'm talking about you and I'm talking about me by the grace of God. In the generation of restoration. Those of us literally who are studying this right now are the remnant, that small group, that remnant, who are looking at these messages, studying these messages, so that we can recruit more people to be restored and enlightened the earth with God's glory, as we will be empowered by the former rain and by the latter rain, empowered by the former rain and by the latter rain. So how does this bring us? How does this bring us? to the parable of the 10 virgins. I pause and take a moment to welcome everybody again. Those who are tuning in right now, I wanna welcome you. We're studying God's word. Happy, blessed Sabbath to you all who are tuning in. It is so great that we come together and study as a family. You, you guys don't know how great of a blessing it is for me. And I believe it's an immense blessing for you as well. It's something to be able to come as a community and study God's word and enjoy the truth as it is in Jesus. You know, the latter rain, one of the effects of the latter rain is unity. The fact that we're all here united right now, we are getting, if it's not the flood just yet of healing grace, at least we're getting some drops. At least we're getting some drops. And I would sing, even me, Lord, even me, let some drops fall on me. We considered already Joel's prophetic guide, but now we're going to consider Christ's prophetic guide for this last generation in the parable of the 10 virgins. We're going to consider Christ's prophetic guide here in the parable of the 10 virgins. This is a prophetic guide that Christ has given for the last generation before he comes to this world. You see, the burden of Christ's preaching was that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. It is thus the gospel message as given by the Savior himself was based on the prophecies. Our messages are based upon the prophecies. Everything that we're doing is based upon the prophecies. It was prophesied that we would be here to do this. Like, okay, granted, I didn't read like my, my name, Michael Verlis, like in a particular book or anything like that, but the ministry name was and is, and we're, and we're, gonna, we're gonna read it in a couple of statements in the spirit of prophecy. It is on time that God is bringing these rays, even these last rays of merciful light. And I want to receive them and be transformed by them. And I pray that God will transform you by them as well. See, Christ's prophetic guide here, I'm calling it a, pro a prophetic guide because it's a parable. Parables are meant to teach a point. They're not prophecy, but prophetic guides because they tend to have dual applications, sometimes even, you know, triple applications. Okay. So when we look at parables, we want to look at them as prophetic guides, but not as prophecies in the sense of like the 2300 day prophecy and things like that. Parables are teaching a point and they are prophetic guides. They're prophetic guides for us. 
So within the generation of restoration, God has a name for those who are studying these things right now. We saw in Joel, Joel calls them the remnant, but we're going to see in Christ's prophetic guide who they are and how we can be in that number, how we can be in that number. So we're going to consider, be here, there we go, yes, the wise virgins and the procession, the wise virgins and the procession. Many who heard the first and second angels' messages thought they would live to see Christ coming in the clouds of heaven. Had all who claimed to believe the truth acted their part as wise virgins, the message would err have been proclaimed to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But five were wise and five were foolish. The truth should have been proclaimed by the ten virgins, all ten of them. But only five had made the provision essential to join that company who walked in the light that had come to them. The third angel's message was needed. Third angel's message was needed. This proclamation was to be made. Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the message of the first Second, first and second angel refused the third angel's message, the last testing message to be given to the world. So here, Sister White is referencing back in 1844. You see, the parable of the ten virgins has application to those living in 1844. But we're going to see that it has application for us today in this generation. It had application for the first generation of Seventh Day Adventism, but it has also application for we the generation of restoration. We're going to see that. A similar work will be accomplished when the other angel, the other angel represented in Revelation 18, gives his message. So after the third angel comes the fourth angel. The first, second, and third angel's message will need to be repeated. Now, she didn't say how many times they needed to be repeated. She just said it will need to be repeated. And as we're in the future, when we study like each generation, we're going to see that it was repeated several times and it's being repeated now. The call was the call will be given to the church. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25 and, and we're going to we're going to share it on the screen. But it's good for you to look at it in your Bible so that you, you know, so you could see that everything that we're sharing is also in your Bible. This is the statement here. The parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself. It was given by Christ himself. And every specification should be carefully studied. A time will come when the door will be shut. We are represented either by the wise or the foolish virgins. We cannot now distinguish, nor have we authority to say who are wise and who foolish. There are those who hold the truth in unrighteousness, and these appear outwardly like the wise. These appear outwardly like the wise. So what we want to do, what we want to do is, 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 is read through the parable of the 10 virgins in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. You see, in Matthew chapter 24, Christ was letting the disciples know what would happen in the time of the end. And then after, so, and after Matthew 24 comes Matthew chapter 25, and there Christ is sharing the parable. So in sharing with the disciples what's going to happen in the time of the end, now in Matthew in chapter 24, now in chapter 25, when he's giving a parable, it's a prophetic guide for the condition of his people in the time of the end. Not just what's going on in the world, Matthew 24, but what exactly is going on with his people? What exactly is going on with his people? So Matthew chapter 25, the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew, we're very familiar with it. We're going to go to it right now. And here we are. The Bible says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. 
and five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Why were they foolish? Because they didn't have extra oil. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Notice the bridegroom tarried. He's not, that represents Christ, of course. He's not lazy. He's not tardy. No, he tarried. He wasn't late. No, he did something. He tarried. And in tarrying, those who would be waiting for him would, by the grace of God, if the grace of God is in, in them, would become patient saints. God is very intentional in every specification. The bridegroom tarried so that those who are waiting on him would become patient saints because they are looking for him, waiting for him with an attitude of love, trust, deep trust that he who said he will come will surely come. Jesus has let you know that he will heal your mind, that he will bring peace into your life. He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil. And he may be tarrying right now and you don't feel that peace. But hold on just a little longer. He who said he will come, he will come. You could trust. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry. At midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Everybody arose and trimmed their lamps. I don't know why the five foolish were trimming their lamps. Nothing in there. But, but they had some activity. They had some work. So you look at them, you go, oh, they're trimming their lamps. They got something going on. Nothing. They look like they have something going on. Not a form of godliness, denying the power thereof, trimming their lamps, knowing there's no oil there. Trimming their lamps, no oil. Are you trimming your lamps? You're, you're at, going to church, doing X, Y, and Z, out and about, moving like a, like a busy bee. No honey. Trimming your lamps, work, 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 no oil. Work with no oil. Everybody's trimming their lamps. And the fool has said unto the wise, give us your oil, for our lamps are gone. But the wise answered, saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Go to them that sell. Let me tell you something. There's going to come a point in time where you cannot buy or sell. There's going to come a point in time where you cannot buy or sell. Now, buying and selling, yes, that's for like the mark of the beast. You can't buy or sell. But there's going to come a point in time when he's talking about buying and selling. He's talking about paying when you're buying, you're paying. Paying attention to the work of God in your life. There's going to come a point in time where you can't pay attention to God anymore. There's going to come a point in time where probation is closed and no more of your mind, no more of your attention is for God because that which is holy still will remain like that and that which is filthy still will remain just like that. There's going to come a point in time where you cannot buy or sell and there will be no oil left. The wise said, go buy because we can't give you ours. Verse 10, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, I know you not. Hey, <laughs> I'm not even going to take the time. You already know how terrible a thought it is that you see Jesus. You sing for him every Sabbath. You do your Sabbath school. You give all the comments in the Sabbath school. You listen to the preaching in church. If they say something wrong, you have all the zeal in the world. So you say, uh-uh, that's not so because you're a faithful Christian. Jesus comes and says, I don't know you. How do you feel about that? The thought that Christ could utter those words, I don't know you, should bring dread to all of our hearts. Do you know him now? 
Does your family know him now? Share with them this video. Do your friends know him? Like now, not tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised. Now, do they know him? Do you know him? As it is your privilege to know him. There is no, you know, I was thinking about a song a little bit earlier. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it wherever you go, precious name. Oh, how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name. Oh, how sweet. He is the hope of earth and the joy of heaven. There's no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved. Save the name of Jesus. Do you, what does that name mean to you? What does that name mean to you? Don't let that when he comes, he says, I never knew you. I don't even know your name. Because you you don't even know mine. What do you, what, 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 who do you say that he is? Don't just say Jesus. Anybody could say that. What does that mean? What does Jesus mean to you? What does Jesus mean to you? Is he worth your time, your attention, your devotion, your energies, your, your emotions, your, your very being? Is, is he worth everything that you are? What does Jesus mean to you? You see, to the foolish virgins, he clearly didn't mean enough. He clearly didn't mean enough, sadly, because they didn't have the extra oil, which again, which represents the Holy Spirit, who's the only one who can make effectual the work of Christ in your life. The Holy Spirit, the only one who could actually give you the knowledge and the understanding of who Christ is. In fact, we're told in the of ages that, um, that the Holy Spirit never leaves unassisted the soul who is looking unto Jesus. If somebody wants to share that quote in the chat, the Holy Spirit never leaves unassisted the soul who is looking unto Jesus. He takes of the things of Christ and presents them unto him. If the eye is kept fixed on Christ, then the work of the spirit ceases not until that soul is conformed to his image, until the image of Christ is restored in you. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, does not stop His work. Until you are saved, as we read in Zive Ages, page 37, paragraph 2, until you are saved, the, the flood of His healing grace will continue to be poured and poured out upon you. Are you receiving the Holy Spirit of the living God to know the truth about Jesus, of who He is, and who He should be in your life? Do you have the oil? Do you have the oil? I got to go. I have to keep it moving. Do you have the oil? Do you have the oil, saints? We have the virgins in this story. The virgins tend to represent the church. A lot of times we'll say, who do, the, who do the virgins represent? The virgins represent the church. The virgins represent the church. And then if there's a bridegroom, we know that the bridegroom is Christ. And then there is the crier, the one that gave that cry at midnight. These are very important keys. I don't want you to miss this because we're going to see this, this, who we are in this prophetic guide. I don't want you to miss this, who we are in this prophetic guide. The virgins representing the church, that's what it says. But I want to improve the thought because remember, parables are prophetic guides. Parables are prophetic guides. And so there's some improvement it's not a change because we can still look at it as a church, but we can enlarge this a little bit more. Those who have the present truth, we read the statement in the past, those who have the present truth, it devolves upon them the responsibility of enlarging it, of, 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 um, of further, she says, further developing it, further developing it. Those who have the present truth, it is their responsibility to further develop it. So let's further develop the thought of what the 10 virgins actually represent. We're told in and Herald, August 19th, 1890, I'm often referred to the parable of the 10 virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. 
for it has a special application to this time. That's the time that she was living in. So she wrote that this in 1890. So I believe that was in the, that's in the 1890. That's in, that's in the second generation. So it has special application for that time in the second generation. We're not in the second generation now, but she goes on to say, and like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. So this parable is present truth for this generation of restoration. Did you get that? This parable is present truth for this generation of restoration. It was relevant to them back then. It is relevant to us right now. So how do we make application of this parable to us right now? Well, it continues by saying, in the parable, the 10 virgins had lamps, but only five of them had the saving oil, which to keep their lamps burning. This represents the condition of the church. You see that? We underline that. The 10 virgins having the lamps, that represents the conditions of the church. So the 10 virgins, the 10 virgins don't represent the church. No. No. The 10 virgins represent the condition of the church asleep. Isn't that what we read in the book of evangelism a little bit earlier? That Christ, he was pointing all over the place and the church was asleep. So this is the condition of this generation. And God has special truths for the conditions of the generation. God has special truths. We read that statement, special truths for the condition of the church. What was the special truth for the condition of the 10 virgins? Ah, ooh, ooh. What was the special truth? For the condition of the 10 virgins, whatever was the special truth for the condition of the 10 virgins is a special truth for the condition of the church today. Whatever was the special truth for the condition of the 10 virgins is the special truth for the condition of this generation today. Follow me as I follow Christ. Because there was a person, people that gave a cry at midnight. The midnight cry, the cry at midnight, the crier. Who on earth is that? I want you to notice something. That the one that gave the cry was not a part of the 10 virgins. The one who gave the cry at midnight was not a part of the 10 virgins. Meaning that the one who gave the cry could see, because what was the cry? Behold, because I'm beholding, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The one who gave the cry was not one of the 10, but the one who gave the cry could see in a dark place. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well to take heed as unto a light in a dark place. The one who gave the cry was not part of the 10. So if the 10 represent the church, then you would have to agree that this message came from somewhere outside of the Seventh-day Adventist church. You would have to agree with that. But, but the Lord help us to improve the thought that the 10 versions represent the condition of the church, not the whole entire church, but the condition of the church. Because we have other people who are not asleep, which means that we don't have to be asleep. We don't have to be asleep. We can be awake and behold the coming of the bridegroom and wake up those that are in the church and let them know, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. How are they gonna know if they don't hear? How are they gonna grow in faith if there's not a preacher? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Somebody has to have the word of God. Those who cried out, behold, the bridegroom cometh, they had the word of God, which is a light, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. They had the more sure word of prophecy where they could see 
the coming of the bridegroom. Who are they? What's their name? I'll show you. This is from Christ's Object Lessons, page 406 in paragraph two. Lingering near the bride's house are 10 young women robed in white. Each carries a lighted lamp and a small flagon for oil. All are anxiously watching for the appearance of the bridegroom. But there is a delay. Hour after hour patch it passes. The watch it, the watchers, the watchers become weary and fall asleep. At midnight, the cry for the special truth for the condition of the 10 virgins that are asleep. The cry is heard. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The sleepers suddenly awaking spring to their feet. They see the what? The 10 virgins, what do they see? Who do they see? They see the procession, a movement of people. Oh, I hope you're following this. They see the procession moving. This is a movement moving on. Bright with torches and glad with music, moving on to know the Lord. In the book of Hosea, those who go on to the, follow on to know the Lord, they receive the early and the latter rain. Those who follow on to know the Lord, they receive the early and the latter rain. They see the procession. They see the procession moving on. Bright with torches and glad with music. Glad with music. They're singing the song of Moses. Hallelujah. They're singing the song of Moses. They, they, they hear the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. And the ten maidens seize their lamps and begin to trim them in haste to go forth. Praise God. I want you to notice that there's an order of the things. I think that this is so interesting. When God showed this to me in the week, I said, I'm going to share this with my friends. Notice in red, I noted that at midnight, the cry is heard. And then the next uh, highlighted sentence, they saw the procession. I thought that that was so interesting. Sister White is inspired. I thought that that was so interesting because it reminded me of John. It reminded me of John. In the book of Revelation and chapter 7. John in Revelation chapter 7. I'm going to turn there so that you can see what I'm talking about. John in Revelation chapter 7. Notice over here. First at midnight, the cry is heard. And then after that, the people that gave the cry are seen. First, the cry is heard. And the people that give the cry are seen. This is inspired. Because John in Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7 and verse 4, Revelation chapter 7 and verse 4, John heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the chosen of Israel. So first John heard. And then after that, in verse 9, John saw. I was excited when I saw this thing. I said, I'm going to share this with my friends. They're going to be excited too. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud, with a loud voice. They cried, saints. They gave a loud cry. Ah, there was a midnight cry, but that midnight cry is going to swell into the loud cry. They gave a loud cry. They cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their face. And they worshiped God. They were, they, they were singing like the procession. They worshiped God. They worshipped him. John heard. And then John saw. The procession was heard giving the cry. 
and then they were seen. Do you hear the cry? Do you hear Christ's gentle voice crying out for you? Do you hear the cry? Do you see that God is putting together his army? You see, when the cry goes out, those in the church, half don't have the oil. And so half will say, that's heresy. That's garbage. That's extremism. That's, you know, they have all these different names for it. Then the other half, they're genuine. They're honest. They were asleep. They didn't know. And some, it was some of us. It was you and it was me. Didn't know at all, but God knew their hearts. They had extra oil so that when the truth would come, when the bridegroom would come, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, when the truth would come, when the bridegroom would come, they would hear. They would accept. They would have an attentive ear. They would have an open heart to receive of him. They would trim their lamps because the Holy Spirit would have spoken to them. The Holy Spirit would have been working with them, interviewing them, talking to them as he did with Nicodemus, as he did with men. Everybody who comes to Christ was wooed by the Holy Spirit of the living God. They would have heard and accepted. And those wise virgins would then join the procession who are giving the midnight cry. And the application for us today is that those wise virgins would join the procession and the midnight cry would swell into the loud cry, which will be given by this generation of restoration who will be empowered with the latter rain of God, the flood of his healing grace. This is the experience for you and I today, saints. This is God's experience for you and for me today. So the crier at midnight is the procession. That's the one that gave the cry, the procession. They had the word of God. They were awake. They are a part of the church. And they wake up the others who are in the condition of being asleep. That's what we're to do. Earlier, we were talking about the condition of the world, the condition of the church being asleep, and God having a special truth for the condition of the generation. The condition of our generation is asleep. And the special truth, God wants to put it in your heart so you can share it with this generation through your life. Not just words, but demonstration. The procession is the remnant we're, 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 it's not everybody in the church. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I don't know how many people it is. We're not the ones who are to determine who is part of it or what. We are just to make sure that we're those individuals who hear his voice and allow the life of Christ to be lived out within us. Yes, Jesus, the King of Kings. Many who heard the first, second, and third angel's message thought they would live to see Christ coming in the clouds of heaven. Had all who claimed to believe the truth acted their part as the wise virgins, the message would er have been proclaimed to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But five are wise and five are foolish. The truth should have been proclaimed by the ten virgins, but only five made the provision essential to join that company. You see that? We read that earlier. I just brought it back again. Only five had the provision to join the company, the procession who walked in the light that had come to them, only five. John was shown these things. I, I was excited when I saw it because I was thinking John heard and after that John saw. And then when I kept on studying and reading through the spirit of prophecy, I saw, she said the same thing, that John saw this. And I was excited. John was shown these things in holy vision. He saw the company represented by the five virgins, by the five wise virgins with their lamps trimmed and burning. And he exclaimed in rapture, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Why are they patient? Because they're awaiting, because the bridegroom tarried. Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, right blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth from this point on. And this is for the study on the on the um, on the special partial resurrection. Uh, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Their works do follow them. 
saints of God, we are coming closer and closer and closer to the second coming of Christ. And he has a special truth that he needs and wants for you. And he wants for me to experience. Let me read a couple of closing quotes here as we close down. The end is near. We have not a moment to lose. Light is to shine forth from God's people in clear, distinct rays. There it is. Right there in the spirit of prophecy. Bringing Jesus before the churches and before the world. Our work is not to be restricted to those who already know the truth. Our field is the world. Continue to study with us because we have some big projects for this year where we want to distribute spirit-filled literature, truth-filled literature, books in the community, wherever we have a chance to. This is our work, saints. We're not just here to preach and make nice videos. We're here to get out there and get the word of God before the world. Let me keep on going. The instrumentalities to be used are those souls who gladly receive the light of truth, which God communicates to them. These are God's agencies for communicating the knowledge of truth to the world. If through the grace of Christ, his people will become new bottles, he will fill them with the new wine. God will give additional light. And all truths will be recovered and replaced in the framework of truth. So we're not sharing anything new. It's old truth. Everything is going to be put together in its proper place. And wherever laborers go, they will triumph. As Christ's ambassador, they are to search the scriptures to seek for the truth that have been hidden beneath the rubbish of error. And every ray of light received, even the last ones, is to be communicated to others. One interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other. Christ, our righteousness. This is where we find our origin. This is where our work stemmed from. This is our raison d'être, our reason for being. Christ, our righteousness. Christ, our righteousness alone. Does this parable apply to us? Sister White says, I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins. Five of whom are wise, five are foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to this time. And like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. In other words, simply put, yes, this applies to us. How do I join the procession? How do I join the procession? If you are balanced by the Holy Spirit, you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You will place yourself in a position. You will place yourself in a position. Huh? You will place yourself in a position where the truth for this time can come in clear, distinct rays of light to you. You will see the truth as it bears upon the present time. And your experience will be in complete harmony with the message of the third angel. Yea, even the fourth angel. We ask the Lord teach us to number our days so that we can apply our hearts to wisdom. As we've been numbering our days and considering the present time and the past, especially the present time, we're considering the special truth for the conditions of our generation. And that is how we join the procession. Considering the special truth for this generation, positioning ourselves to hear the truth, to receive the truth, to, to get it positioning ourselves to get this truth for this time that we are to experience the flood of healing grace. The flood of healing grace. You will place yourself in a position where the truth for this time can come in clear and distinct rays to you. The fact that you're watching this, you are positioning yourself to be a part of the procession. 
The fact that we are studying this, we are positioning ourselves to be a part of the procession that is the remnant, that is those restored in the generation of restoration, that is the children of Zion, the generation of God that received the latter rain, the 144,000. You see the connections. Do you see the connection, saints? Re re review this study to make sure you get every specification. God wants you in the procession. He wants you to join so that this procession's cry can swell into the loud cry. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, not just behold the bridegroom cometh, but rather behold your God. And that is our message to the world. Behold your God. The earth is going to be lightened with the glory of God. So we want them to behold him, the kind of person that he is, his methods, his character, his principles. We are to tell to the world by the way that we live, move, and have our being, behold your God. The last rays for this last generation of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is the revelation of his character of love. That is it. There's nothing more. It's not another schedule. It's not another prophecy. It's not another, I don't know. It is the kind of person that God is. Any doctrine that does not tell you something about the beauty of the kind of person that God is, is worthless. It is worthless. Every doctrine of grace is to show you Emmanuel, God with us. The kind of person that he is, that a holy God would dwell with sinners like you and like me. That is love. Your friends may give up on you. Your family may give up on you. Your father, your mother, your church, your pastor may give up on you. But God's love, when all else fails, hey, when all else fails, love never fails. Prophecies, they'll fail. Knowledge, vanish away. But love, love never fails. The time of test is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun. The loud cry is the message that is empowered by the latter rain, the final cry to the world, the truth about our God. The loud cry has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. This is the beginning of the light that will swell so that we can actually see the bridegroom coming in the clouds. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Is your home ready, your church? Are you noticing a change in your life, in your thoughts, your motives, your ambitions? The way that you speak to people, the way you think about others when they do something to you, what's your attitude towards those who disagree with you? What happens in your heart when someone speaks wickedness about you, when they lie about you, when they cheat on you, when they deceive you, when they use you, when they gaslight you. What happens in your heart? Yes, pain, but but is the love of Jesus still there? Jesus was so surrendered to his father so that he could love people that don't even care about him. And that quality of love is what he wants to place in your heart but it could only be there by faith, even the faith of Jesus. The, the loyalty that Christ had towards his father gave him the strength to never hate any one of his father's children. I'm gonna say that again. The loyalty that Christ had for his father strengthened and empowered him to never hate any one of his father's children. What is in your heart towards your father's children? 
Is it love? Is it love? Is it love? Father in heaven, we want to be Christians in our hearts. We want to be in the procession that would enlighten the entire world with your glory. We're excited about the opportunity that your sacrifice affords us. But Lord, it's not just the opportunity to, to glorify you, vindicate your character, but God, we, we, we actually want to be changed so that, that that experience may be ours. We need newness of life. We need the oil. Many of us are trimming our lamps knowing that we have no oil. Lord, help us. Give us the flood of your healing grace. We need your calm spirit to fall upon us. We need your grace. We need your truth that would make us free this generation of restoration. We realize that you're visiting us through these studies through our prayer meetings, through our church meetings. You're visiting us. Lord, we hardly see changes sometimes. We desire a change in our life. Oh, God. Forgive us. Father, in the name of Jesus, cleanse us of all of our sins and of all of our unrighteousness and restore your image in our home. Every single individual who is watching and who will watch, touch them their families and do that enlightening work for them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Saints, I pray that you're with you. I truly do. I believe that God has visited us in a very special way. He doesn't just want us to know that it's in this generation that he's going to do this work. He wants us to realize that it's with you, with me, us individually. He's going to pour out this latter rain on. Next week, study, we're going to consider the time of our visitation. The time of our visitation for this generation. The time for our visitation. We're going to be studying the watches. They are in connection with the generation. This is a study that you do not want to miss. I hardly hear anyone speak about the watch. I hear, I, hear, I hear a few people speak about it. Not much. And I want to be able to share this with you so that you can have it clearly by the grace of God. We're going to be studying that in our next study. And in the studies after that, we're going to study a bit more on the latter rain. I need for you to understand more and more, and we all need for ourselves to understand what exactly latter rain is, what do we expect to come as a result of it, and be excited for those studies as they're going to be interactive. So we thank you for your love, for your grace. So happy that we can study with you all and your families and with your friends. If you enjoy these studies, continue to view, make sure you give it a thumbs up so that the YouTube and the Facebook algorithm can continue to get these messages further and further and further. To communicate with us in the email at lastgrayministries at gmail.com. That is lastgrayministries at gmail.com. We'd be happy to speak to you if you want to study with the gospel, your church, whatnot. You could always feel free to send us an email. We're happy to share God's word wherever it is that He calls for us to go. If you'd like to support the ministry and the work that we're doing, you could always do that through um, the various different um, uh, modalities that are in the description of this video. But our deepest desire is that you be richly blessed by the healing grace of God in Christ. May God richly bless you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and to your families. God bless you and have a happy, blessed Sabbath.